Welcome back to the church history study. Bienvenidos al estudio de la historia de la iglesia. Today's title is the Church Fathers, the Apostolic Church Fathers, Part 1. El título de hoy es La Verdad se defiende, Parte 1. Over the last several weeks, we have seen several attacks made against the truth, both internal and external attacks. Por los últimos dos semanas, hemos visto los diferentes amenazas, que son los dos internos y externos. Some of those attacks include the Gnostics, the Jewish and Roman persecution, the Judaizers, and Montanists, and the Greek philosophy. Algunos son los Gnósticos, la persecución, los judaizantes, el monásticos y la filosofía griega. There are other important attacks that we're going to look at, but that is enough to get us started on our journey. Hay otra amenaza que vamos a ver, pero eso es bueno para empezar el peregrino del día de hoy. Uh, so starting this week, we're going to begin to discover uh, what the church is. Entonces empezando en el día de hoy, vamos a, a ver cuál es la iglesia. The church of the early church was primarily one, which means, uh, which is where we get our word ecumenical. Ecumenical means one. La iglesia en esa época era una, y el, esa significa ec, ecunémico, and, y eso viene de la palabra una. And secondly, it, the church is Catholic, which means universal. Not Catholic with a big C, but Catholic with a little C. Y aparte, la iglesia es católico, no es católico como pensamos católico, pero universal. Con letra pequeña. And it is apostolic. It was delivered to us from the apostles. Y también es apostólico, que significa que viene por los apóstoles. And it is orthodox, with a little o, which means cor correct beliefs. Y es ortodoxo, que significa creencias correctas. And it is the church, which means assembly. Y también es la iglesia, que significa asamblea. So it is the uh, ecumenical, universal, Catholic, apostolical, orthodox church. Así que la iglesia es, es la iglesia ecumenico, católico, apostólico, ortodoxo y la asamblea. And this is where theologians, Christian philosophers, and the apologists were born. Y eso es donde vienen los teológicos los filósofos los filósficos cristianos y los apologísticos Today we begin our story with a man named Polycarp. Hoy empezamos la historia con un, un hombre que se llama Polycarp. He was the apostolic bishop of Smyrna in Asia Minor, which was near Ephesus. Él era el obispo apostólico de Esmirna que era en Asia Menor, cerca de Éfeso. And he was publicly executed in, by the Roman authorities in 155 A.D. Y él fue ejecutado públicamente por las autoridades romanas en el año 150. So he was Entonces, John's protege. Policarpo era protege de Juan, el significado de discípulo. He was basically the one that John wanted to take over the business, so to say. Que Policarpo iba a llevar el, el, la, la compañía, eso es decir, hacer la misma obra. And so he carried the torch of truth forward, uh, securing it from invasion, basically. Entonces Policarpo llevaba la antorcha. Eh, para que, que seguía, what did you say? Torch forward, carrying the torch forward para que from seguía, invasion. Seguía adelante. And so, uh, Polycarp is an apostolic father. Polycarp is one of the fathers apostolic. Which means that they were one of the first bishops appointed by apostle. One of the first obispos que fue ordenado por un apóstol. Or an, uh, a very close disciple to one of the apostles. Or un discípulo de uno de los apóstoles. So, Polycarp and other men like him were given the needed authority at a time when the church 
uh, was under siege by powers of darkness. Policarpo y otra gente como él tenía esa autoridad cuando la iglesia estaba un tiempo difícil. Especially in a time when there was no bound Bible. Especialmente sin la Biblia que tenemos en el día de hoy. And so this, this authority became known as apostolic Uh, apostolic succession because these were the apostolic bishops. Entonces, esa sucesión apostólica. So these apostles added, um, they added their own kind of spice. Each each apostle kind of added their own spice to theology. Que cada uno de esos padres apostólicos uh, ayudaba un poco de la teología. Dice, él ha dicho como una especie a Uh, a la otra. And these apostolic fathers carried that forward, like Paul, we hear a Pauline theology, which means that theology that came from the writings of Paul, or Johnine or Juanine theology, which is theology that came from the theology of John. Entonces, han dicho como teología Juanian, es decir, teología que vino de Juan. One of these, one of the negative things that happened during this time period was that the the church began to turn away from the doctrines of faith and grace, from the, the pendulum the pendulum of faith and grace towards a works, almost a works-based legalism form of doctrine. Not that they got away from faith and grace, that was always there, but that the pendulum started switching towards grace, uh, towards works and legalism. Entonces, una de las cosas que era mal de, de afrontarse con mm -hmm. esas sectas yeah. Que el What? péndulo se salió desde solo la gracia hasta un poquito por legalismo. Why, why do you say that, H? Why do you think they needed... Because it just drifted up into God speaking out of people and blah, blah, blah. All these the crazy things are going on. They need to get back to basics. Uh -huh. and say, no, these are basics. Focusing on behavior. Okay. And what was going on with the Gnostics? What were some of the Gnostics doing? Yes, do anything your body wants because it's only natural. And then they were fighting against the Greek kind of pulp culture as well. Entonces era como así más legalismo y eso era como por medio de lo que ha sucedido con todo el pecado de los gnósticos y también por la filosofía griega y entonces ellos tenían que hacerlo como los básicos, las cosas más básicas. And so while the, while the focus of the apostles might have been more heavily on uh, what we believe, the focus on the church fathers started becoming slightly more heavier on how we behave. Entonces en el principio era más en qué creemos, pero ya después con la, los padres de la iglesia tenía que ser cómo estamos soportando. Or what we call orthodoxy over orth uh, orthopraxy over orthodoxy. Entonces, orthopraxia por orthodoxy. So if orthodoxy Orthodoxo. is correct or right beliefs, what do you think orthopraxy is? Entonces, orthodoxo significa correcta forma de pensar. Entonces, orthopraxia. Yeah. So right or correct behavior, actions. Es la correcta forma de, de, de actuar. So remember that these two always work together in harmony, right Entonces, beliefs and right actions. Because like James in the Bible reminds us that faith without works is dead. But, you know, the opposite is true too. Works without faith is dead. Uh, el opuesto también está correcto que la fe sin obras está muerta, pero también la, la fe sin obras está muerta. So, less. So, so we see that, you know, on one side of the pendulum, you have, like I talked about last week, remember we talked about pendulums? It flows from heresy to heresy until we find orthodoxy in the middle. 
Eh, recuerda que la semana pasada lo hemos dicho, el péndulo a veces era de herejía a herejía hasta que encuentra ortodoxo en medio de, de eso. So what we had was like, say some of the Gnostics was faith without works, other side works without faith, it's got to swing back towards the middle of Entonces, right beliefs produce right actions. Los Gnósticos como creía que era fe sin, sin obras, y otra gente que creía que era obra sin fe, entonces en medio era ortodoxia, que era la correcta forma de pensar. Is this still around like 160 AD? Well, we're, we're, we're talking now about, we're going to be kind of backing up a little bit, so we're, we're even going to be talking about sometimes in the first century. Entonces eh, estamos tomando un paso detrás hasta el primer siglo. Because for the for all this time now I've been setting the stage for all these attacks on the church and now we're going to see how the church responded to the attacks. Entonces no hemos hablado de las atacas contra de la iglesia pero ahora estamos viendo la respuesta de la iglesia. But basically we're still in the second century. Pero todavía estamos en el segundo siglo. So so in the second century the church is responding of the cheap grace of the Gnostics and some of the other groups towards back towards you know but it's kind of overcorrecting towards legalism. Mm -hmm. Como que el péndulo ahora está un poquito más por legalismo. So we start to see a, a slight difference. I mean, it wasn't a great thing. A slight difference between the writings of the apostles and the writings of the church fathers. It wasn't a huge movement. The pendulum like didn't swing all the way over, but we start to see it swing down towards legalism. Does that make Entonces, sense? Entonces se puede ver el péndulo que era que moviéndose un poquito más por legalismo, no era una diferencia muy grande. But remember, we have to give them some slack. Why do, why do we need to cut them some slack? Pero tenemos que darle gracia. Y the attacks, think about all, all this that's going on in the church. Por todas las atacas que estamos pasando. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about these church fathers, these first, these, the very early very close disciples of the apostles. Entonces, para la próxima semana vamos a estar hablando de la, la, los padres de apostólicos. But one of the things that may surprise you guys the most is that some of these church fathers aren't actually people at all. Algunos de esos padres apostólicos no son gente. Some of these uh, church fathers, what are called church fathers, are writings by people who were closely related to the apostles. Entonces, no son gente, son escritura de gente que eran gente conocido por los apóstoles. So writings that we know were apostolic that came from the early uh, apostles' teachings, but we may not know who wrote them. Entonces, escritura por esa gente, pero puede ser que no sabemos quién era el autor de esa I mean, escritura. So, I mean, for example, Hebrews in our Bible, it's considered scripture. It's canonized in our Bible, but we have no idea who wrote it. We just know whoever wrote Hebrews is closely associated with the apostles. It's Solo apostolic. sabemos que era una persona muy cerca de los apóstoles por su forma de, de escribir. So some of these, some of these, uh, some of these letters, some of these apostolic church father letters would eventually make it into our Bible as scripture, and some of them would not. Entonces, alguna de esas cartas iba a, a llevar a ser un parte de la Biblia y otros que no. But even if they didn't make it into our Bible, they're they're they they're still very important to the church. Y aun si no está en la Biblia, todavía son escrituras importantes para la iglesia. So, I'm going to give you a list of the apostolic church fathers. So, I was going to write it on the board, but I didn't have time. Some of them are accepted by the whole church as apostolic church fathers, and others are not. Aquí está una lista de la escritura de, de esa gente. Y algunos de, de ellos están aceptados por la, los padres de la iglesia y otros que no. Uh, we have to discuss that later when we discuss the canonization process. And are you talking about now or then? Both. Okay. Now and then. So, 
the ones that are accepted by the whole church, by all Christians, as apostolic church fathers, uh, besides the ones that made into our Bible, are Clem the writings of Clement. So that would be First Clement, which we're going to talk about today. And los que fueron aceptados por toda la gente son la escritura de Clemente. The writings of Ignatius of Antioch, which we already talked about a few weeks ago. También la escritura de Ignacio, que fue mandado por Not scripture, gente. or yeah. I guess scripture and writings are very similar in Spanish. Uh, uh, the writings of Polycarp. La escritura de, de Policarpo. Then a writing known as the Didache. Y también una que fue el, el Didache. The Didache means of the twelve, which the longer title is the, the teaching of the twelve apostles. Donde significa de los doce y son enseñanza de los doce apóstoles. The Epistle of Barnabas. El Epistle de, de Bernabe. And the Shepherd of Hermas. Y el Pastor de Hermes. Now, the second list I'm going to read to you, uh, some accept them as apostolic church fathers and others do not. Uh, en la otra lista está, alguna gente lo acepta, pero otro que no. The second letter of Clement. La segunda carta de Clemente. And, and the reason why a lot of people do not accept that one is because... Um, all biblical scholars agree that it, or all uh, church historians agree that it was not written <clears throat> by Clement. Que todo lo, eh, gente estudiosos se han dicho que no fue escrito por Clemente, entonces por eso no, no están seguros de aceptar. A writing called The Martyrdom of Polycarp. Y otro era El Martirio de Policarpo. In a writing called the Epistle of Diognetus. La Epistola de Diognetus. In the writings of Papias. Y Papias. So some of these we're going to talk about, some of them not. But you feel free to go read them on your own. You can look them all up. Son algunas de esas escrituras. Uh, the, the writings of Papias. No, sorry, the Epistle one. of Diognetus. Diognetus. Yes, it's D I O G N E T U S. Vamos a hablar de alguna de esa escritura, pero no vamos a hablar de todo. Entonces, si tú quieres estudiarlos, lo puedes hacer con tu tiempo. Are we going to talk about the apocrypha? We'll talk about, we'll talk a little bit about the apocrypha later. But that's going to be even after the canonization of scripture, because the apocrypha wasn't in the canonization. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, um, so <clears throat> not everyone accepted these as what? The first list, everyone accepts them as church fathers. Uh -huh. The second list, most accept them as, some accept them as church fathers, others do not. Uh, so, so, just, let's make it this way out. There's lots and lots of documents and papers. Right. From all these different people. Right. Okay, we haven't yet got to the, who's going to go and buy right. the X Factor. We're going to look at everything here yep. and go through it. Mm -hmm. That's what we are in mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the ones that are closest closest to the apostles that we are almost certain were apostolic but did not make it into the canon later we call church fathers today or their writings and is there a book for that? Uh, no no but you can each one of these writings that I talk to you about you can look up and read them individually Why don't they do a book? There, it might be in a book you can check it out check it out agent and tell me because we might be able to buy a book of the church fathers well oh there is, there's a, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, um, volume, I mean, it takes up an entire room of shelves called the Anti-Nicene Church Fathers, Post-Nicene uh, Church Fathers and Post-Nicene Church Fathers, it takes up, and it's all the writings of, of yeah. every church, all, all the church history from over 2,000 years. Yeah. yeah, but you can just buy the Anti-Nicene Church Fathers. And that's the early church writing. So all these writings, plus all the writings of Justin Martyr and, and Ignatius, everything's in there. Yeah, so you can buy that. So if you bought like the first couple of volumes, it would have probably all of this in here. But there are, there are all these writings exist. Yes, yes. Can I ask a sorry, question? The uh -huh. last name of the fully accepted lot was the Shepherd of? Hermas. Hermas. So Hermas is H-E-R-M-A-S. And we're going to talk more about that one later, too. Um, so someone might think that Barnabas or the Epistle of Barnabas was written by the Apostle Barnabas, but it was not. Uh, but it's still a, a, a church father. And the reason why is because... Oh, go ahead. 
la epístola de Bernabé, eh, la gente se cree que era el autor Bernabé, pero no está escrito de Bernabé. It was written by someone in the apostolic succession of Barnabas who wanted this writing to have apostolic authority. So they were also writings that were in existence, sometimes then and sometimes later. Uh, but were not included in the canonization and were not considered church fathers. Yes, yes, later and added them back in. And is that Roman Catholic or Catholic? Father, and the reason why is because... Oh, go ahead. La Epístola de Bernalve... La gente se cree que era el autor Bernabé, pero no está escrito de Bernabé. It was written by someone in the apostolic succession of Barnabas who wanted this writing to have apostolic authority. Alguien que era discípulo de Bernabé que quería que la escritura de Bernabé tenía que tuviera autoridad en la la asociación apostólica. So the extra books in the Roman Catholic Bible. Uh, they were also writings that were in existence, sometimes then and sometimes later, uh, but were not included in the canonization and were not considered church fathers. Yes, yes, later and added them back in. And is that Roman Catholic or Catholic? Well, Catholic, Roman Catholic is the, there's only the Roman Catholic, Catholic just means universal, so the Roman Catholic is the, is the, the, the denomination, yes, yes, yeah, does that, everybody clear on that now? Okay, I know that's confusing, so for example, like the, the most famous Gnostic writing, which is one of those writings you're talking about, is is uh, the Gospel of Thomas, but it's it wasn't written by the Apostle Thomas. It was written in the uh, second or third century. And how do they know that? Because of the timing. Yes, in the wording, in the type of Greek that was used, the way they wrote the Greek. So you wow. can you can there's all kinds of like criticisms. You can put these. Should be like an antique. Yes. Yes. Break it down. Yep. Wow. Like you can look at the what like when you look at an antique furniture, you can see. Uh, what kind of machinery were, what kind of cut marks do they have? What kind of, same thing with all these writings. Wow. Tristan, do you want to translate that? <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get back to the study. <laughs> so another important thing to remember is that all of these writings, all of them were considered scripture at one time by at least some Christians. Lo importante es saber es que toda esa escritura era como palabra de Dios por por alguien ha pensado que era palabra de Dios por un tiempo. So even the Gnostic writings, because the Gnostics thought they were Christian, right? So um, even they considered their writing scripture at one time. Los Gnósticos creían que ellos estaban escribiendo la palabra de Dios. However, for us today. The church fathers are considered orthodox, the right teaching, but not canonical. They weren't included in the scripture for one reason or another. Entonces, esa escritura que fue escrito por los padres de la iglesia, aunque que tienen autoridad, no fueron incluidos en la Biblia. So, the, the one I want to talk about today is Clement of Rome. Uh, not to be confused with Clement of Alexandria, which we will talk about later. No, Clemente de Alejandria. So, uh, we'll get back to Polycarp eventually. I was just kind of throwing that in there as a teaser. Uh, but now let's switch to Clement of Rome. Entonces, vamos a hablar más adelante de Policarpo, pero ahora estamos hablando de Clemente de Roma. And, and be sure to go back and, and read those chapters if you get time. Entonces, si tiene tiempo de leer esos uh, eh, capítulos que habla de Clemente. So, uh, Clement was the bishop of Rome in, around the year 90. Clemente era obispo de Roma en el año 90. So, who was he a contemporary of? 
Entonces, de, de quién era contemporary, contemporary. Who was alive? John was still alive. Contemporary of the Apostle John. On his way out. Yeah, on his way out. So he wrote a letter to the Corinthian church uh, from Rome, uh, just as Paul had done before him. And this letter is, is, is known as First Clement to distinguish it from Second Clement, which was most certainly not written by him. But First Clement is important because it's one of the earliest uh, preserved writings outside of our our New Testament writings. Es muy importante esa primera epístola de Clemente porque era una de las primeras escrituras que nosotros lo hemos tenido, lo hemos visto, aparte de la escritura que es la palabra de Dios. So it was written in 90, around 95. Entonces fue escrito en el año 95. What else was written around 95? Revelation. Revelation. So written around the same year as Revelation was written by John. So <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can't. I put the link up there so you can read it. Uh, so this uh, this uh, letter uh, deals with a lot of the persecution that John talks about in his letter as well because. It's under the emperor Domitian, and remember, Domitian was persecuting people. Entonces, esa carta habla mucho de la persecución porque estaba debajo del emperador de Domiciano. But also, it, his writing, Clement's writing, kind of mirrors Paul's writing to the Corinthians. Clemente también está escribiendo a la iglesia de de Corintio, y su forma de escribir es muy parecido de Pablo. Do you know that, what time was that Paul wrote to the Corinthians? Uh, Paul, Paul wrote to the Corinthians probably sometime between 50 and 60. Yeah. <laughs> so Paul was dealing with an ununified Corinth church. They were divided. And what's interesting is 30 years later, when Clement writes to the Corinth church, he's still dealing with the same issues. They're still divided. And like uh, Ignatius of Antioch, Clement commands the church to obey their bishops and their, and their elders. Igual que Ignacio Clemente también manda a la iglesia obedecer a su obispo that, y sus ancianos. That God has appointed over them. Porque fue Dios que lo ha unido a esa gente. But some of the younger believers in Corinth had rejected the bishop's authority and were trying to out him. Había gente en la iglesia en Corintio, más jóvenes, que estaban rechazando la autoridad y intentando a rechazar el obispo también. And in a third issue that he writes about in this letter is that just like during Paul's time, they were having trouble still believing in the resurrection of the believers. Que todavía, igual que en el tiempo de Pablo, esa iglesia tenía problema de entender la resurrección de los creyentes. So he's still trying to encourage them about the truthfulness of the resurrection. Está todavía animando a ellos que la resurrección fue verdadero. However, uh, Clement uses something about the resurrection uh, as a symbol of the resurrection that uh, would be embarrassing to modern Christians today if it had been canonized. So he uses the, the phoenix as a representation of the resurrection because he believed in that the phoenix was real. But, you know, science has proven today that there's no such thing as a phoenix. The phoenix as in the... The bird, bird that dies and then is raises from the dead. Oh, sí, sí, so phoenix. 
Why is that what? Because he's using it. Mythology, like Egyptian. So he's not using it to teach Christians. He's just using it as an illustration, saying we can we can look at the bird of the phoenix and see how it's resurrected from the dead. Uh, Egyptian, I think. So he's, he's just saying you can you can look at the phoenix and how this bird, like he believed that bird existed. But that would if that book, if First Clement was included in our scripture day, that would be embarrassing for us to defend as Christians. Porque era mitología. Él él usaba esa esa pájaro, esa ave, pensando que era real, pero no era real. Entonces para nosotros sería un poco de vergüenza tener eso en la palabra de Dios. But you know he he didn't. I mean. War with science back in. He okay, didn't we, know yeah. anything there about. There is a Leviathan in our scripture. Yeah, there is. A, yeah. yeah, there is a Leviathan. Yeah. Yeah. Is that why it wasn't? No, that's not why. But I'm just pointing out that, you know. <coughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, so. And there's another reason why this letter is extremely important to the church today, though. Pero hay otra razón porque esa epístola era muy importante para la iglesia. So, even before the second century began, we have a bishop in Rome who feels comfortable giving commands to another church not inside his jurisdiction. Antes del de segundo siglo, hay un obispo en Roma que siente cómodo para dar mandamientos a una iglesia que está fuera de su jurisdicción. This is more of John's jurisdiction. So even before John dies, we have a bishop in Rome kind of giving commands to another church, not Eso his era jurisdicción de Juan, pero había ese obispo en Roma que ya sentía autoridad para dar mandamientos a otra iglesia. No. Yes, right. He did, he did. But there was a wide uh, held belief within the entire church that Peter was the leading apostle of the apostles. Entonces, porque mucha gente se creía que Pedro era el apóstol de los apóstoles, el líder de todo, y Pedro well, estaba en Roma. So what significance is this? Uh, we're going we're gonna to get there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, basically, based off of Paul's, uh, Peter's statement to Jesus in Matthew and in Jesus saying, Upon this rock I will build my church. We'll get to that in our group discussions, but that comes from Matthew 16, 18. So in in the line of apostolic succession, Clement's pedigree kind of almost is like seen as more authoritative because his pedigree goes back to Peter. Entonces el linaje de Clemente era como más importante porque su linaje llega a Pedro, el apóstol. So from the beginning we see that there is a bishop in Rome and his followers felt that he had a special seat of apostolic authority for the church. Entonces podríamos ver que había un obispo en Roma que ellos se creía que tenía como más autoridad. So this is in the first century still. Eso está en el primer siglo. But this was not... Uh, this was not an idea that was held by the entire church. And we are still light years away from this being a pope. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Right. Can I just ask this, Mr. Here? Clement, uh -huh. his apostolic um, lineage would have come from? Peter. From yes, and because he was the bishop of Rome, mm -hmm. and Peter was the one who was supposed to be the head of okay. Rome, Peter and Paul. But and both. How, how directly would that have been? Directly? Very, directly. Very, directly. Very directly. Very directly. And he didn't mention the Phoenix. He probably would have made it. No, it, it was not, it was for different reasons. Mm -hmm. 
And so this, this idea, the sentiment, though, was not held by the entire church. Not everybody felt like he was, he was more authoritative than them. Okay, I already translated okay. that last. So now these early uh, Roman bishops, uh, Clement didn't feel like he was superior. He wasn't trying to give an idea that he was superior. He did not believe he was superior. Clemente no sentía que era más importante de los demás. Um, they only believed that they were able to solve disputes uh, better because they went back to Peter. Solo pensaron que puede ser que ellos tenían la habilidad de, de reconciliar los discursos porque ellos vinieron de Pedro. And so, uh, because they were trying to dispose a bishop, here we have a bishop of Rome who is trying to not be superior, but to say, uh, but because his pedigree goes back to Peter, he's trying to solve this issue and hold the church together. Entonces está intentando no decir que he presumido que él viene de Pedro, pero decirlo como con autoridad que se puede solucionar el problema. That's pretty much where we're going to end the day. Who's got questions or comments? I'm just wondering if someone said that. Can you answer me the question? Is there any book, as far as you know, in the New Testament that's been included after John's death? Uh, so, uh, how many books are pre John and how many books are after John's death? Uh, after, you know, in the Bible? In the Bible, all of the books of the Bible were written before John's death. All of them. All of them. So, so that, I'm saying that it's also about Clement who really could have. He could have. But a, if there's no other book that's included since the death of John, why would Clement have been any good? Maybe that was a cut off point. John's death, there's no book going in after John's It had to follow three, there were three. Um, Three criteria. criteria for apostolic uh, for uh, canonization, and um, I'll, we will go over that when we get the canonization. Well, but is there any book after John included in the New Testament? No. There you go. That's kind of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After it was well, canonized. Some of the stuff there because right. it acts there before the Revelation. Well, there was John. there was some there was there's even a book the Didache that was written in se around 70, so written at around the same time as Matthew. But that wasn't included. It wasn't included. But we're going to talk about the didache. Nothing after included. No, no, nothing no. after John's death that I know of that was included. Uh, the Apocrypha, I don't remember. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would make sense, because... Yeah, that's that's right. Right. Because, no, because at this point, it, really great. Yeah. it had to... That's why I was really interested. So John's death was the end. So what nothing's of, going on after. Because one of the criteria, one of the main criteria for canonization uh, was, you need to translate this too. Estamos hablando de cómo formó la, la, la idea de la palabra de Dios, que tenía tres diferentes criterios. Y estamos hablando de que no había otro libro en la Biblia que vino después de Mark. So one of the criteria was that it had to have been uh, written by an apostle or someone very closely associated with an apostle. So by the time we get to second and third century, we're already way too far removed from the apostles. Uno de los requisitos era que tenía que ser escrito por un apóstol o alguien que fue discípulo de un apóstol. And that keeps it safe. Mm -hmm. Really right. safe. Mm -hmm. And what about the old? The Old Testament was, was, I mean, they had the Old Testament. That was already considered scripture. That wasn't up for debate. Because of the Jewish. Mm -hmm. But the New Testament hadn't been formulated yet. Uh, that's where we're going to stop today. See you guys later. So before we go, though, we need to add the questions. So the first question is, how do we hold orthodoxy, correct belief, in proper balance with orthopraxy, correct behavior? ¿Cómo podríamos mantener el equilibrio entre ortodoxia, que es la correcta forma de pensar o creer, y ortopraxia, que es la correcta forma de actuar? All right, and so the second question is, read Matthew 16, 15 through 18, 
how do you interpret Jesus's statement to Peter and why do you interpret this way? La segunda es eh, leer Mateo 16, 15 a 18. ¿Y cuál es tu interpretación de, de lo que dice Jesús a Pedro? ¿Y por qué lo has interpretado en esa forma? And the last question is, what are the so what's of today's teaching? What are your big takeaways? ¿Y qué son las cosas que tú vas a tomar del estudio de hoy y pensar más adelante? All right, see you next week.